Hello everyone, welcome to the module on intermolecular forces and production energy surfaces. We are still discussing production energy surfaces and in this lecture we shall look at a couple more examples of production energy surfaces and this would help us to compare and contrast the examples we are going to discuss today with the examples we discussed in the previous lectures that is mostly H3 system. So, before we get into today's lecture, let us just recap what we learnt about the H3 system and then we will go ahead and look at a couple of more different kinds of systems. So, in the previous lectures, we have been looking at uh, production energy surfaces of uh, H3 system and also the different kinds of trajectories on the production energy contour maps. And we also saw what are called as attractive and repulsive uh, potential energy surfaces. So, just to refresh your memories, I will try and show that for the AB system, ABC kind of systems. So, we had uh, looked at these kind of maps. right and we had said that if the the saddle point could be here or the transition state that is one uh, and the saddle point could also come closer here that is somewhere here and it could also be somewhere close to this point and we had called them by different names one we had this we had called it as attractive attractive production energy surface and this we had named it as the repulsive. And what we had said is that uh, in the case of the attractive you the translational energy if the kinetic energy is completely translational then you would end up in the formation of the product. So, I would just write it here as translational. energy and whereas in the case of the repulsive we had said that if the molecule is in the vibrationally excited state then that would lead to the formation of the product. This was primarily because if the molecule is in the vibrationally excited state it could actually sort of uh, go across this barrier or the go across the corner which it encounters and then uh, go over the saddle point to reach the product right. So, then you must be actually thinking uh, what is the significance of this or why is he even uh, sort of making a big deal out of these attractive and repulsive interactions right. So, the reason why one studies this is that if you actually know for a given system whether it is an attractive uh, potential energy surface or repulsive potential energy surface then you can actually uh, make sure that the molecules are in the vibrationally excited state by pumping them to higher excited states. That would ensure that you get the products far more easily. So, that is the reason why one tries to study these production energy surfaces and understand whether they are attractive or repulsive in nature, right. So, having learned this about, uh, uh, about the H3 kinds of systems, now we will go ahead and take a look at other kinds of systems. So, a classic case is this uh, a potential energy surface of the uh, HCN or H plus CN system where uh, what you see here is the potential energy surface of an HCN system. So, just to make it clear I will draw the system which we are interested in. So, we are looking at H plus CN giving HCN right. So, the moment I have this I will have to now uh, pick the coordinates or the uh, degrees of freedom which I need to vary. So, I am sure you will all be thinking one would be this obvious one that is the distance between the H and C 
and the other is the distance between the c and the n when they are all coming in a collinear fashion right so this is one that is r c h and then you can call it as r c n as the other degree of freedom right so now if you take uh, these two degrees of freedom as the x and the y axis as shown here and if you now look at how does the energy of the system varies by varying each of these independently and calculating the total energy then you would end up in a 2d contour map similar to what you have what you see on the screen right so you the moment you see this i'm sure you would have noticed it the stri striking difference is that when the rcn and the uh, h come closer together you see that there is a very deep hole or there is a very deep well this part of the contour map correct so what that suggests is that the h plus and cn when they come together they form a very strong bond that is a hcn bond that is what it indicate that means the energy the, there you have the deepest well and please compare and contrast this with the h3 system where what we had was we had actually a, a, a we had a top of a hill at around this point okay so so please uh, uh, compare this with the hcn system in the case of in the case of the h3 system we had a, a higher energy hill state around this position whereas when you come to the hcn because of the uh, attractive interaction you have a very deep well or a bond formation in this case the the depth of the well is very large because you forming a covalent bond and the energy is uh, is mostly in excess of about 200 kcal per mole and that's a very large number so what this uh, also tells you is another feature that is if you look at this energy profile a bit more carefully you'll see a one more feature here that feature is if you look at this you see that the rcn still has a this part there is a contour which is going in that means it's deeper whereas the rch there it's already at very high energy that means these are already going to the uh, there there is no lower energy state there that is because if you take the rcn or the cn uh, c triple bond n that's a very strong bond that that will be considerably lower energy compared to the the ch bond which is going to form right so typically then the situation would look something like this you have a cn bond which is here and then the ch bond which would form ultimately would be the energy state would be somewhere here and the depth of the well is here it's even significantly lower so this is what you see in this contour map where you do encounter a region where the rcn is showing a lower energy compared to the rch right this is just because of the inherent stability of the c triple bond n compared to the ch bond which is going to form thus the when these two actually come together you they undergo a covalent bond formation and they end up in formation of the product and the, the this is so what i would want you to sort of notice or take note of is is that this is sort of in in complete contrast with the h3 system where you had a, a top of the hill top of the hill or a saddle point when you uh, when you brought the a to the bc system right so i hope that gives you a, a, a feel of the difference between the hcn and the h3 kind of systems so having looked at hcn now let's go ahead and look at another system which is a h2f or h2 plus f giving hf so here uh, what i have shown here is uh, again two uh, both the degrees of freedom what you can think of are shown here that is i have uh, hh and then f gives a hf plus f right so one degree of freedom you can think of varying is this that is r h h and the other is this the, the bond which is going to form which is r h f right so these are the two degrees of freedom which you can typically think of when the both the systems actually come head on 
or when the dietal angle is, uh, is, is about 180 degrees between the systems. So, in this case now if you take these two degrees of freedom and plot a 2D contour map then you would get a contour map which is uh, similar to what you see on the screen. And here uh, what you see are the different numbers represented where each of the number actually corresponds to the uh, the energy or the energy surface of uh, energy corresponding to that slice in the three dimensional potential energy surface. So, if you remember in a couple of lectures ago where we had said that we construct the 2D maps by taking slices in the three dimensional surface. So, those slices or the point where we have sliced are the energies which is shown here corresponding to different uh, lines. So, here what you see is the following feature that you start with the uh, you start with the H2F system on the far right side here H2 plus F and as you actually come across then you would hit uh, then you have a, a small bump or a saddle point and the moment you actually cross that you would end up going way deeper in energy that is you go from about 1.6 kcal per mole to about minus 34 kcal per mole and that is because you form a very strong HF bond with the equilibrium bond length of about uh, 0.93 angstrom. So, what you are doing is your uh, uh, both H2 and F are coming closer together and then you are crossing a small barrier of about uh, 1.5 or about between 1.5 to 2 kcal per mole and then once you cross that then you are going down deep in the uh, energy level or going uh, lower in energy and then you ultimately you form the HF bond which is significantly stable or significantly more stable compared to the starting material. So, this is what is very apparent from the system. However, there is also very nice feature which is apparent if you re, uh, remember our discussion on attractive and uh, repulsive potential energy surfaces. So, if you now look at this a bit closely what you see is that the saddle point is somewhere here which is very similar to what we had seen for the case of the attractive uh, uh, attractive potential energy surfaces where the saddle point was more towards the right. And we had said that when you have an attractive potential energy surfaces then the translational motion or if the kinetic energy is completely translational that would lead to the product and the product would be in the excited state. Exactly a similar scenario is happening here that is when the H2 and the F actually come and collide or when the uh, trans when the kinetic energy is completely uh, where the activation energy is completely in the form of the translational then the collision would take place more efficiently and that would lead to the product HF which would be in the excited state. Okay. So, I hope this gives you an idea of uh, a potential energy surface or an attractive potential energy surface. So, let us call this as and the molecule which is going to come out will be the product will be in the vibrationally excited state. Right. So, this is wo uh, what a typical potential energy surface would look like for a H2 plus F system. We can actually go ahead and try and look at the same thing in a three dimensional fashion that is if I take the uh, potential energy surface and now look at it in a three dimensional way that is before I slice it. So, then you would see a, a potential energy surface like this where you have the H2 plus F coming from this side on the left hand side and you form the uh, you cross this small barrier here which is the uh, saddle point and once you cross that you go deep down in the well where you end up in forming the products right. And you must have uh, noticed that what I have shown here is this uh, something called as uh, I have written some numbers here CAS CF AUG CCPVTZ. That is the level of computation or the level of uh, uh, computation or the calculation at which this potential energy surface was computed. And typically I think I told you this in, in, our, uh, in our discussion on potential energy surfaces in the a few lectures back that 
usually the potential energy surfaces are computed by varying the different coordinates that is the HH and the HF uh, distances in this case. And you would look at what is the energy of the system as you change each of these coordinates separately. That is exactly what is being done here at the particular level of theory mentioned on the slide. And that would lead to a, the potential energy surface you see. So you must be wondering now, uh, so we now looked at three kinds of potential energy surfaces that is we looked at first uh, we looked at the H3 system and we looked at the uh, HCN system and finally we tried looking at the HF system right or the H2F system. So then you must be thinking why, uh, why are we even studying this? What is the significance of studying these potential energy surfaces or even computing them? Or what do they tell us? So that is a very important question and the answer lies in uh, trying to understand the system. So let us imagine tomorrow you are trying to uh, optimize a new process for, uh, for any sort of a chemical reaction or any anything which is involved in, in the chemistry. So there these kinds of potential energy surfaces actually do give a lot of mechanistic insights. They give an understanding about uh, what is the barrier or what is the amount of energy I need to supply for the process to take place, which is a very, very crucial and an important in piece of information to have because if the barrier is too large, then you would, uh, you would think of what are called as catalyst to lower them. If you had no means of understanding or figuring out what the barrier is, then you will actually not even worry about a catalyst, right? So one thing uh, which uh, these potential energy surfaces would help you enormously in is to tell you what is the barrier or what is the uh, amount of energy you need to supply to go from one, uh, one of the reactant to the product or one conformation to the other conformation. And uh, so the other thing is like we discussed in the attractive and the repulsive potential energy surfaces. So it would also tell you whether the reactant should be in the uh, vibrationally excited state that is should you excite, should you take the reactant uh, to a vibrationally excited state so that the reaction occurs or you should do it from the ground state. So these are actually very, very crucial uh, piece of information which would, uh, which can be obtained from potential energy surface. And once you have this information, that helps you to optimize a given process which you are looking at. As a part of your chemical engineering, you could be looking at many different processes. So in all of them, one can construct a similar potential energy surface. And in this, in our discussion, we, had, we were mostly confined to uh, potential energy surfaces where a reaction was involved. That is uh, either like H2 plus F giving an HF or a, a H plus CN giving an HCN. However, one can also come up with potential energy surfaces for conformational conformation or conformational degrees of freedom, like in case of proteins or in case of molecules where molecules can occupy different kinds of uh, conformations. So all of this will uh, help you to understand the system better and optimize your process so that you can do it in a more efficient manner. So with this sort of a world's eye view perspective, we shall uh, stop our discussion on uh, potential energy surfaces and intermolecular interaction. Thank you.